Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, give God a hand for praise. Hallelujah. How many of you know God is big? Hallelujah. He's strong and he's mighty. My God, yeah. so strong, so mighty, my God, plans for me, goes beyond my wildest dreams. My God, my God, is big, is big, so strong, so strong.
Thank Hallelujah. you, God. Hallelujah. Yes. Can we say hallelujah? Hallelujah. 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 Thank yes. you, Jesus. Yes. For being a big, big Come God. On hallelujah. Come on yes. Hallelujah. We thank hallelujah. you, Jesus. Thank you. For Jesus. being a big, big God. Hallelujah. 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 We yes. thank you, Jesus. Yes. Yes. For yes. being a big, big God. Yes. So how many of you want to press a little further in his presence this morning? Can we press a little Hallelujah. further? Hallelujah. 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 Uh, have your way, Jesus. Hallelujah.
pressing. We're gonna keep pressing. 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 pressing.
If I could just press, press in your presence, behold the beauty of your face. If I could just press, press in your presence, never leave this place again. If I could just press, press in your presence, leave all my cares behind me. I will be whole. I'll still believe. I will just lay, lay at your feet. I will be whole. I'll still. Grace Gospel Chapel. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let's put our hands together one more time. You know, we give God the glory. We give God the praise. But it's always good to encourage our brothers and sisters that get up here and praise the Lord. Help us to praise the Lord together. So my name's Chaplain Howerton. I want to take, uh, I'm, I'm the new guy here. I'm the new guy. Thank you. I wanted to take a moment to introduce myself to y'all. So if you remember uh, Chaplain Fortune Asaboku, he was a, a member of the chapel, chaplain team here. So I took over for him at uh, 194 Field Artillery. And when I, when I was going to switch out with him, he says, you got to meet Chaplain Ibanga. you got to meet the people of Grace Gospel Chapel. So they've supported my unit. They've done all kinds of wonderful things for us. They've, they're helping me bring God to soldiers and soldiers to God. So I said, sure, I'd love to meet. I'd love to continue that relationship that this unit has with that chapel. So I called Chaplain Ibanga, and I, you know, I talked with him. And we kind of get a time for me to come here and introduce myself. And, and he goes, you know what? You know, I know you're, just, you're coming to introduce yourself, but I'd love for you to be a member of the team here, the chaplain team here at Grace Gospel Chapel. I said, sir, thank you for the invitation, but this will be the first chapel that I visit. And I've been here before. I know I am familiar with the caliber of ministry and worship that happens here at Grace Gospel Chapel. And as I received that invitation, I thought, man, I don't know. I felt like, I felt like a little bit like Moses. Like, Lord, you know, I, I don't have good words to use. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I can do this for you. So I prayed on a little bit, and I thought, well, I'll go and visit, introduce myself, continue that relationship, get around, see the other ones, and see where I'm at. And, and, and Chaplain Ibanga agreed, agreed with this. But you can, you can understand my, my timidness. You guys have a wonderful team here. That Chaplain Ibanga shepherding the flock. Chaplain Gladden. He could read the phone book and it would sound important. Every, come on now. Chaplain Johnson. Sending fire from up here. You saw Chaplain Moss last week running that picnic. Providing a high level of fellowship and, and friendship at that event. Chaplain Okiwe. Chaplain Smith. This is the big show for chaplains here. And, and so you can understand why I might be a little timid in this. But so I came and did my... Oh, Amen, sister. She says, God's got me. When I came and did my visit, I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking I'll introduce myself, and then I'll make my rounds to the other chapels. And I'm sitting there, and Chaplain Ibonga is right up here. He's right here. He says, Chaplain Howerton, stand up. Introduce yourself. 
get up, stand up, I wave with my little mask on. He goes, Chapman Hound is taking over for Fortune. I said, okay, that's 194 Field Artillery. And he is joining us as a member of the chaplain team here at Grace Gospel Chapel. I thought, I thought, Chapman and Bong, and then we have this conversation. It's the first one I came to. But then I, it popped in my head. It ain't about me. It's about Jesus. Jesus, I accept what you have for me in this invitation to join this chapel. Because like I said, this isn't the first time that I've been here. I've sat out in that congregation before, working on the things that I had to do to become a chaplain. And I can remember sitting out in that congregation and praying, Lord, I know I may not be a good fit style-wise, but if you could see it in your endless plan, in your goodness and your kindness, to let me be a part of this chapel someday. That was years ago. That was years ago. They done tried to get rid of me a couple times out of that program. I made it through. They done sent me to Fort Bragg to be a chaplain. I made it through. They done sent me to Afghanistan to do chaplain work over there. I made it through. It's about Jesus. He answered that prayer that I had so many years ago. It's about what Jesus does here in this chapel. I saw three little children give their lives to Christ not more than a month ago. There's what, six people signed up to get baptized. It's what Jesus does here. The praise for Christ gets raised up here every week. It's about Jesus. So as you are able, please stand with me as I read from the Word of God. From the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 14, starting at verse 1. One Sabbath, when he went to dine in the house of the ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin to be shamed to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when you ho the host comes, he may say to you, friend, move higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at the table heard him, heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the banquet in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all like began to make excuses, for the first one said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. 
And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Holy Father God, you are good, great, wonderful, and mighty. Thank you for your grace, your peace, your patience, your love, the gift of the cross, Lord God. Thank you that you want us, not because you have to, but because you want to. Thank you that you call us, not because you have to, but because you want to. Thank you that you use us to be builders of your kingdom, not because you need us, because you're going to build your kingdom with us or not, but you let us be a part of that, Lord God. I ask that you be with us here today as your word is delivered, that it be about you and not about me, that it be about you and not about us, that you would utilize it to guide us, to lead us, to change us, to become the church that you want us to be, Lord. That you would continually guide us more on your narrow path, Lord. I ask for a special blessing upon the family of Bernice Cox as they experience the loss of her, Lord God. I beg for your comfort and your presence in their lives, Lord. I beg all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. So the title of my message today is A Confrontation with Christ. And so this scene that we see here in Luke, Jesus Christ going to dine on the Sabbath at one of the rulers of the Pharisees, house with other Pharisees and other prominent people present, the lawyers. There's a conflict, there's a tension that happens between him and them. And first we see as, I don't know if if as he's entering or somewhere at the very beginning of this meal, there's a man before him suffering for an ailment whom he heals And immediately, there is conflict. But Christ, being the great teacher, the great healer, uses that as an opportunity to both heal and to teach. And goes on to give them and us these three parables utilizing a meal and a banquet for them and us to better understand spiritual realities of his kingdom. Now, this conflict that happens happens in the context of a particular culture. I would, I would argue that at some point in everyone's life, they are confronted by Jesus Christ. There's a conflict and a tension that happens spiritually. But these men had one both physically and spiritually. And it happened in the context of an honor and shame culture. And I'll go into greater depth here in a moment. Because uh, we get this in, in English. The originals were written in Greek, and the depth of that language far greater illustrates the level of that conflict. And he both jumps from the physical healing of this man. The physical stories about these dinners and banquets and gatherings and jumps to the spiritual. 
And at the time, Luke wanted to show how the Pharisees rejected Christ and held on to their own self-righteousness and ultimately didn't make it to that banquet in that final story that Christ told. Wouldn't make it to the kingdom if they held on to that self-righteousness. What I want to show us today is a a confrontation with Jesus can lead to healing, humility, and heaven. A confrontation with Christ brings healing. So we saw here that on that Sabbath day, he went into the dining house with the rule of the Pharisees, and it says, they were watching him carefully. Watching him carefully. And this is the beginning of that conflict. Because when I looked, and I'm, I'm no Greek scholar, folks. Far from it. But luckily on my phone, there's a little app with Strong's Concordance where some really smart people long, long time ago who was really good with language figured it all out. And now somebody's stuck in an app and me or you or anybody can have that at our fingertips from when we study our Bibles. But that idea of they were watching him carefully in the originals meant they were looking for him to mess up. They were looking for him to do something that they could make a claim against him, that he could char- they could charge him with something, something that he would do where they could call him out for a wrong. They were watching him carefully. It says, there, behold, that man with the dropsy, that man with the illness was before him. They were looking to see if he was going to heal him on the Sabbath because they didn't like that. Because if we, if we remember from several chapters earlier, this isn't the first time that Jesus had been confronted with someone who needed a healing, and it was the Sabbath. If we remember the paralytic that was let down through the roof, I mean, it was so crowded out there, they couldn't even get to him. They tore the roof apart. They let him down. First, the Lord forgave him of his sins, and then he healed him of his ailment. So this is not the first time that they've tried to catch up Jesus. Because he knew it then, right, says he? He knew what they were thinking in their hearts. He knows what they're thinking right now. They're looking to catch him up. And behold, there was a man before him with a dropsy, and Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? This idea of responded holds with it a, a greater weight than just He asked him this question. It holds with this the weight that he knew they were looking for something in him. He responded because it was expected of him. He knew they wanted that response. It says, but they remained silent. Then he took him and he healed him and sent him away. This idea of take, it's not just he comes up and puts his hand on the man. It's as if he grabs him, he takes him, he heals him, and he frees him. The idea of sent away is a freeing. That let go is a freeing of once, of what once held him captive. And as he sends the man away, he begins to teach to them. And again, it says, uh, they remained silent. Then he took him and he healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. They held their peace. Now, I think in this moment, he heals him physically. And he transitions into the spiritual lesson. This idea of saving something from the pit. Pulling it out. Does the name Baby Jessica have any meaning to anyone in here? Baby Jessica? Remember that? Some of our 
Well, I, no one that wasn't born in the 70s would probably remember that name or know the importance of that at, at the time that it happened. So in Midland, Texas, 1987, there was an 18-month-old baby girl who came up missing. And they searched and searched and searched for this child to no avail, could not find this little girl. And if you know anything about Texas, and especially Midland, Texas, apparently they do a lot of oil drilling down there, a lot of holes in the ground. So they get some of these men who are familiar with this trade to come out with their instruments and begin to check these different wells, these different pits on this land. And as they drop a microphone down into one of them, they hear the whimpers of a small child. This 18-month-old baby had fallen into an 8-inch round pipe and was over 20 feet below the surface of the ground with one leg straight up beside the side of her head jammed within this pipe. Now for any human with a little bit of care in their heart, you can feel that, right? For those of you who have children, you can really, really, really feel that, can't you? So you can imagine the pain and suffering of her parents when they find out that their daughter is buried in this pit, unable for anyone to get her out. In fact, she remained in that pit for three days, over the course of three days, 56 hours over the course of three days before they could get her out of that pit, before men could dig down and retrieve that child and give her back to her parents. And what I would argue is that's the kind of spiritual dilemma that we are in. That's the kind of pit that Christ is talking about. Spiritually, we are all as helpless as that 18-month-old baby that's down in that pit. Spiritually, we are impossible. It is impossible on our own for us to get ourselves out of that pit. We need Christ to come in and reach down in that pit and pull us out. So whether that pit is, is sin, we need him to pull us out. Whether we're down in that pit because of a broken relationship, we need him to pull us out. Because there's going to be things in life, that, challenges that we were going to come up against, where he's going to prove to us there ain't nothing that we can do on our own that's going to get us out of that pit. We need Jesus to pull us out. We need Jesus to bring the healing. A confrontation with Christ brings humility. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lower place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So I don't know if this is something you can relate with. Going to an event where there's a lot of self-important people there and they kind of take their spots of where they think their honor is, rank themselves. You know, the uh, Pacific Lutheran University, the Lutes over in Parkland, their football team 
has an activity they do every season at the very beginning. So the coach brings them all in there, and now there's probably 50 young men, 50, 60 young men that are on the team or wanting to be on the team. And he tells them, he gets them in a big room like this. He goes, okay, here's what we're going to do. Based on where you think your leadership skills are with relation to this team, I want you to rank yourselves in order of importance, starting with the number one guy right here. Can you imagine what that looks like? A room full of alpha males trying to decide who's the, the best one out of the bunch. So in a similar little way, that's what you have here. These men, these Pharisees, these lawyers, these religious men of the time, utilizing their frame of measurement for holiness with ranking themselves for the positions at which they will set at greater levels of honor at this feast. They're not going off a of God's frame of measurement. They're not going off a of Christ's frame of measurement. They're going off of the rules and the tradition of man. But in the kingdom of God, the rules and the tradition of man has no place. It can't be used to measure God's kingdom. And what is very interesting here, no matter where it's the people who think they should have honor are the one whom Christ points out going and sit at the lowest place right from the beginning everyone becomes humbled either they come to Christ humbled or they become humbled by Christ scripture tells us this scripture tells us this elsewhere every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord So whether they come in thinking it's them, and they got it, they got the things, they're worthy in and of themselves to come into the kingdom, they're going to bend the knee. Or they come in humbled, they're still going to bend the knee to Christ. Because that place of honor is for Jesus. Although Christ is talking about this physical dinner, He's teaching us a spiritual lesson. But in this honor and shame culture, in this confrontation with Christ, that doesn't set too good with everyone at the meal. A confrontation with Christ brings heaven. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be, re be repaid at the resurrection. But get this, it says, When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. You know, and at face value, that sounds good, right? Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Not in, at face value, that is true. <laughs> but it's that way that he enters in to the conversation with Christ. That first word of verse 15, when one of those who reclined at the table heard these things, he said to him. It's not what he said, it's how he said it. Because that in the original implies conflict. When Christ confronts him with the truths and the realities of the kingdom of God, he doesn't like that. He's just ranked himself spiritually, applied holiness to himself based on the rule of man. He doesn't want to hear that everyone must come humbly. 
that everyone's going to have to sit in that lower seat. The master of the banquet is the one that gives the honor. God is the one that gives the honor. How he came into that conversation was him disagreeing with Christ. How he came into that conversation was him saying, blessed is everyone who's going to eat bread in the kingdom of God because we done earned it. Because we are good enough to get it all on our own, how I've been living my life. Devoid from anything that God's done for me. He's telling Christ he did it himself and he deserves to be there. Christ goes on to say, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. And they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited shall taste my banquet. Christ's response to him is, You've been invited. You've been placed in this position of authority as these religious leaders of my ministry. You were the first ones I invited. But you have rejected my invitation. You have told me you had better things to do in your lives than to come into my house. So th this great banquet is the kingdom of God. This place that they're invited to is the kingdom of our God and Father. In fact, where he says, that my house may be filled. That word house that is utilized, that's more than just a physical structure. That's more than just stones and bricks and blocks and wood and nails. That's as if he's asking him to come into his house and become part of his family. So what's he do when the self-important people have rejected his invitation to be a part of his family. Go to the broken, go to the lame, go to the sick, go to the poor. Go to the homeless. Bring them into my house. Go to those that know they have an issue and are willing to be healed. Go to those that know they have an issue and are willing to be pulled out of the pit. Go to those that know they need to come before me humbled. Go to those that know they must bend the knee to Christ, proclaim him as king. Let them be a part of my family. Go to those that need the healing, come before me humbled, and let them come to heaven. So as a church, what does it look like for us to seek healing, humbleness, and heaven? How do we support ways for us to continually be healed by Christ and to answer 
Christ's call to desire that in others' lives. Because there's the rub. There's the confrontation with us. Because, you know, if we're just inviting our relatives and friends and rich neighbors, well, then it's easy. Then it's easy. But if we got to go out, invite the lame, the crippled, the homeless, it's a little bit harder for us to do. And that might look just like the lame and the crippled and the homeless. Or it might look like others that think a different way than we do. That don't immediately conform to our expectations for the church. It might mean we stretch ourselves like Christ stretched himself, coming down out of heaven in the glory, setting aside a part of his glory to put on flesh, humbling himself to reach out to us. How is Christ calling us as a church to humble ourselves and reach out to the world? How is he calling us as a church to go out to the hedges and the highways to bring them in? It can be hard sometimes. We hear them talking in ways that we don't like. You know, we're not a perfect church. And when I, when I say that, I mean like the, the eternal church. Has, it's had its ups and its downs over the years. It ain't always done the, the right things. But good thing, it ain't about us. It's about Christ. He's going to build his church whether we're here or not. And if the generation won't do it, he'll bring up another generation that'll do it. So as a church, we did a little bit of that last week with the outreach event, the picnic. We literally had a banquet <laughs> and y'all invited people that could never repay that back. But how do we do it spiritually? How as a church do we humble ourselves as we're called to? And as an individual, how do we respond to this confrontation with Jesus Christ? Now I would ask you if, uh, you know, perhaps... You accepted Christ into your life. You came before Him looking for healing, humbled, and accepted what He had for you decades ago, years ago, months ago. So maybe you're coming before Him with a broken relationship that needs healing, with a heart that needs healing. Come before him, Lord. I come before you humbled, but I don't know how to invite the poor and the lame and the homeless, or I don't know how to invite that person that broke this relationship. I don't know how to give them that forgiveness from my heart that you've given me, Lord God. Pull me out of that pit of unforgiveness. Or maybe... You've never had that first experience where you've come before Christ acknowledging that need for healing. Perhaps you've never come before Him and humbled yourself to receive what He has for you for that spiritual healing. And there's a lot of things that can get in the way of that. can get between you and that and accepting that invitation. You know, I've heard, you know, I, I'm going to do that someday. 
That, so, that sounds good, but not right now. My answer to that is, you don't know what tomorrow's got in store. I've heard, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but, hey, you live a good life, and I think you get to go to heaven. I tell you what, these Pharisees, these lawyers, they probably lived a pretty good life on the outwardness of it. And Christ is telling them that ain't good enough. So if this is your first time where you've been confronted with this need for healing and you're feeling that itch in your spirit where Christ is saying, come before me humble. I've come out, I've invited you to the banquet. I've invited you into the kingdom. I've invited you to become a member of my family. Don't let this moment pass you by. Don't let this invitation go unanswered. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Holy Father God, thank you for your mercies. Thank you that you invite us into your kingdom. Lord God, I beg that there's, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior that has not answered that invitation, that you would guide them, continue to call them. Don't let them run away, Lord God. Seek them out on the highways and in the hedges to heal them, to humble them, to bring them into your kingdom, to make them a part of the family, Lord God. And Lord God, if there's anyone here that, you know, that needs pulled out of whatever pit that is, Lord God, that needs pulled out of the pit of unforgiveness, that needs pulled out of the pit of a, of, of a long-standing brokenness in their life, that needs pulled out of the pit of a sin that's getting in the way of their relationship with you or what you want them to do in your kingdom, that you pull them out right now, Lord God. And Lord, I may, maybe it's that first time for someone in here, and I will, I will pray a sinner's prayer of repentance and invite them to you know, in, in, the, in their seat to pray along with me, in the quietness of their heart to pray along with me and accept what you have for them to become a member of your family and your kingdom, Lord God. Holy Father God, I come before you. I acknowledge I have not always been a part of your plan, Lord God. I acknowledge I have sinned. I acknowledge I need healing, Lord God, spiritual healing that I can only get from you. I confess that Christ died on the cross to take away those sins, to wash me clean of those sins, to absolve me of those sins. And I confess that he rose again, and because he's alive, I can be alive. Because he died on the cross for my sins and rose again, I can have new life in you, Lord God. I beg and I pray this in the Lord Jesus Christ's name.